Welcome to It Feels Right, brought to you newly by Selkirk TV. In today's episode, we are going to touch on the future of MLP and what that looks like. We are going to go over Adam's tip of the week and simple tips to improve your game. And of course, uh, talk about the PPA recap and a couple of hot topics trending up or trending down. Let's get after it, Robert. Because you know why? Why? Because it feels right. It feels right. Legendary. What's up, everyone? Rob Nunnery here with the It Feels Right podcast. I wanted to drop a quick note because we recorded yesterday and obviously the merger just took place, just signed off. Um, so the PPA MLP merger, which has been kind of pending forever, is now official. And we talk a little bit about it on the podcast, but, you know, obviously it wasn't official at the time. So just wanted to send a quick note saying, thank God that's done. Uh, we can move on, hopefully have PPA MLP under one umbrella and get to enjoy the team events as well as the tournaments. And obviously Adam and I will break it all down in our episode next week, but did want to send a quick note saying it's done. The merger happened. Let's carry on. Welcome back, Adam. It's been a minute. You didn't say press that button, which, you know, it's, it's fun because I'm not pressing the button this time. Somebody else is pressing the button. Well, that's why I didn't say it. And uh, before we get too deep into this podcast, hello, Robert. How are you? Hi, Adam. I'm doing just 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 fine. I'm I'm here in Florida. Um, it's not hot here yet, which is very very important to me and my um, fair complexion. I like to stay out of the heat. So my ideal temperature on a on a sunny day is about fifty four degrees. Well, uh, your fair complexion, what does that make me? Because I, I see you next to me on screen, and I'm looking pretty pasty. Uh, and you look like you have a bit of color to you, and I think you look a little bit better than me, and that's concerning. Well, what doesn't look better than you is that beautiful salt and pepper beard that um, I could only aspire <laughs> to have. Yeah, 10% salt. I got some orange, some red some brown and some blonde. Uh, so I'm, I'm letting it fly and I, I like the mix of colors. You know, it's been a, it's been a little minute since we've recorded and, you know, I, I've kept a pulse on what's happening obviously in pickleball. And I've heard some comments out there of just like, man, I just really miss the, miss the, it feels right podcast. I wonder they haven't recorded in like two months. What's the deal. And we've got some fun updates. Yeah, we do. Uh, I've, I've been getting 15, 20, 25 messages a day. Uh, just IFR, where are you? I need you. <laughs> All over the world. Uh, we got some Scandinavians, some Southeast Asians. They're just, they're, they're into the pod and we got to give them what they want, right? Yeah. So I wanted, I do want to start this whole pod out with a big thank you to the Dink. They, for the past, I think since August 22, when we first started this uh, podcast, the Dink has been our partner in terms of producing, editing, publishing, and they've been incredible. They've helped. They've helped get the pod out there, get it to the people, put it in their newsletter. So big thanks to Thomas and JB and those guys over there that put a lot of work into into producing the pod. So we've okay. transitioned to a new podcast partner, which is a very natural fit because it is our paddle sponsor and apparel sponsor, and that is Selkirk. So they've obviously made a huge push in, in content and digital reach. And who else to partner with Adam than, than just, well, two high-end content creator influencers and the pickle sphere, such as yourself and myself. So Selkirk. Elite. Uh, oh, I forgot they, Elite. I forgot Elite. Sorry. Yeah, Elite, uh, you, you got to squeeze that in. And that's why we're partners, Robert, because we pick up when someone lacks somewhere. So, uh, yeah, it, it really does make a lot of sense, and I'm very excited for it. Uh, they got a solid crew. They're putting out content left and right, as you said. Uh, and that's what we are now. Well, you're, you're hybrid. You're still a player, but I'm full in yep. uh, on the commentary and the, and the content creation. So let's, let's ride it. 
Yeah, and I think I think with this transition to Selkirk, we're gonna. I think it's gonna be a it's gonna be a win for everybody because one thing that we have not been necessarily, which is what we very much are in our pickleball games, Adam, is consistent. So. We are going to pick up the consistency on the pod. We are going to have a regular recording schedule on Mondays each week, so it'll be a perfect timing of kind of unpacking what just happened in a weekend tournament and then also being able to dive into a preview of the upcoming week. Uh, So, yeah, we're going to record Mondays. We're going to publish on Wednesdays every single week. So you guys can finally know that there's going to be a It Feels Right podcast coming out Mondays. I mean Wednesdays. 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 We're recording Mondays. There you go. So every Wednesday though, you're gonna have a new episode to listen to, which you know, that feels that feels good from uh you know, from our standpoint just because um yeah, every time we don't have one in the week it's just like you know, it hurts my heart a little bit. So I like I like yeah. doing these and I think it's gonna it's gonna allow us to have a better yeah, better rapport with, with our audience in terms of what's happening. Uh, unstructured structure. That's that's what we're looking for, Robert. Because we can't, we can't. You can't put us in a box. You just can't. We're too. We do. We do what feels right. And uh, just having a little Selkirk TV guiding us along the way is just a, a perfect combination. Yeah, and I think on top of the consistent schedule, I mean, we're going to try to have a little bit more consistent topics, segments. Obviously, it's not going to be too structured because our tangents take take us wherever we may go. Because it may feel right in the moment. Um, but I think we are also going to work on just increasing production quality. So this is kind of a new thing for us, Adam. Usually what happens a little behind the scenes of the It Feels Right podcast in the past is we log into a platform. I send Adam a link. He pops in. He, he starts yelling at me to hit that button, which I know you guys hear a lot of. Hit that button, Robert. Hit that button. And then I hit the record button. We record. And then we send it to the dink. They publish. We have we have a live studio audience today, in a sense, Adam. We have we've got Mr. Cooper Deck um, listening in. We've got a new producer listening in. So it's uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. We've got yeah. So we got Josh and Cooper. Uh, Josh is going to help produce the show. He's uh, the new media manager at Selkirk. So this is the whole production now. Look at us go, Adam. We've graduated. We're in the big leagues now. Do we have do we have an applause button or something? Can we, you know, <laughs> kind of just. Hear, hear, hear the roar, kind of from the studio, the, the studio audience. Uh, I think that would be awesome, but maybe we'll uh, we'll delve into that in the future. Uh, Rob, I wanted to ask you a question, and I know you had some issues uh, a month or two ago with a knee problem. How is that knee looking, and what is your at least short term uh, playing situation looking like? Yeah, so I found like I felt some tightness in my knee the past I would say a few months or so, but then at the APP in Punta Gorda, I was playing mix with Susanna Barr and we were playing Andre Mick and Allison Harris, and it was like the very end of the match, and we were up a game in like uh, I think it was like nine five or something, and I stretched weird. I kind of put my I kind of stretched did the ankle stretch where I put my kind of weight on the outside to stretch the inner the outside of my ankle and I felt like a little twinge in the inside of my knee and I got yeah I got super sore after that really swollen where I couldn't really move anymore after that we somehow played men's the next day and got to the final but I had to pull out of the final with Andre against Will Howells and CJ Klinger and then went, um, you know, went to Orlando basically the next day where I was supposed to be doing a Selkirk exhibition, but got an MRI done and it showed a, com- a complex uh, medial meniscal tear. So tore the meniscus, sadly, um, looked at a few options, right? Because I wanted to, I really, I've done a lot of work with global sports in India and I didn't want to miss that trip. So I really wanted to make it happen. And... Um, ended up going, um, got a got a cortisone injection in my knee, which which obviously is not going to fix a meniscus tear, but it it relieved some of the inflammation and let me let me manage men's doubles at least, where I have to cover a sliver of the court where Mr. Andre can do his thing. So um, yeah, got through India, which was great because you know I think just in terms of my personal goals, I, I want to be super involved with with pickleball internationally 
And that's a, it's a super important relationship that, you know, that I've built with those guys and wanted to support them in what they're building and help, help kind of raise their talent and, and grow the sport in India. So, but yeah, long story short, meniscus is torn. Um, I'm trying to avoid, I had the same issue with my left knee. Uh, you probably remember that Adam a couple years ago and, and got, got a, did arthroscopic surgery for that one and got back in like six weeks. But the issue with that, when you trim out the meniscus is it basically sits as kind of the shock absorber of the knee. So when you trim some of that out, it doesn't, it, it doesn't regenerate. It doesn't, it's gone forever. So if you do that, you're losing absorption at a later age and it leads to earlier, um, arthritis and stuff like that. So, it's kind of last resort is, is trimming, trimming it out. So I'm right now I'm just trying to rehab it really hard. I'm going to forego APP Sacramento, um, which is in a couple weeks here. And I am going to try to be ready for the, the major APP, which is in Miami. And that's 150 K and, and more, more ranking points and all that. So I have, um, Andre for that as well as Susanna again. And, um, yeah, so not, I certainly not an ideal situation, but, um, yeah, got to deal with it. Yeah. That's injuries are silly. And that'll be actually a bit of our discussion later on in this previous, uh, PPA in Mesa last weekend, couple, couple of fellas, uh, had some issues with injury themselves. Uh, so, uh, that was a very serious little segment from you, but I'm going to lighten it up a bit here, yeah. Rob. Do you prefer... Susanna's nickname to be the net lord or the dark horse because both apply to her that's a hard question adam because like you said both are very applicable but the astounding thing to me is the frequency of net cords and i know people say you know it all shakes out it all buffs out it all it's all equal at the end of the day no it's not not for the net lord it's not not for the net lord dude she, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's the ball she hits. It's like this dippy top spin ball that for whatever reason, never hits like the top of the net and falls back on her own side. It just, it always trickles over and she's always like, ex at this point she like expects it, right? Like she's like, oh yeah, it's just my shot. And, uh, she's, she's doing this new thing where, um, well, I don't know if she's doing it, but Ryler to heart started doing it in India where he does it. And he's, and he starts saying my pleasure, my pleasure. I I, I kind of like that. I kind of like that actually. Yeah. So, uh, but I think dark horse is also very applicable because she's, you know, she's perpetually underrated. Like and the Katy I, and the Katy Perry song that goes perfectly. Somebody did a little, her playing pickleball over the Katy Perry dark horse song, and it was one of the best things I've ever seen on social media. So, uh, hot take. I think the Car the Katy Perry California Girl song is. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's like such a feel-good song. It might be in my top five. Wow, that is a bold statement, Robert. Uh, anything Katy Perry does to be in your top five is strong. So, uh, like, I would like this is where in the future where we now we have a new producer where it would just we would just be hearing it and we'd just be dancing and it would be <laughs> just you know just a couple California girls just doing a podcast. So, future, I'll, I'll melt your popsicle. Uh, so, uh, Rob, I think, I think that, uh, I'll we're all, I'll melt your popsicle. <laughs> I mean, is that not a line? Is that not a line? In the... <laughs> if, if, if it's not, that's really bad. If it's not, if it's not I'm pretty it. sure it, there's definitely a popsicle in the song. I don't know if it's, I'll melt your popsicle, but yeah. Okay. Look, it, I'm, is, it, it is. I'm, I'm getting, red. I'm getting, I'm getting confirmation that it is, um, it is, it is. A lyric, so okay, yeah, good, you can mount my popsicle any day, sir. <laughs> uh, also, uh, now we we had mixed in some tips and some, uh, you know, for our uh, so, some of our amateur viewers uh, throughout previously, but now we're going to make it a bit more of an emphasis to try to do it every week. And uh, I have a pretty good one to start off, Rob, and I think it's very important. And I'm going to give a mini shout out to Zane Navratil. I came across one of his uh, videos. And uh, the reason it's a mini shout out, because I was teaching this before, and I have done a little less teaching the last year, 18 uh, this months. Is, this is like, it's a shout out, but it's also like, 
Zane stole this from me because I am the originator. I, dude, that yes. was like that was so perfect. Well done. Yes, yes, exactly. I wanted to make. Sure, I'm glad that you picked up on that. So yeah, uh, and really, and, and I think it's very important. And it's a shot progression. It's whatever the shot may be. It could be a speed up from the kitchen line. It could be a drive from the back of the court, or uh, especially the soft stuff with your drops and your dinks. You start playing, and what I mean by that is very straight to the ball, very linear. Uh, we keep that paddle in the zone as long as possible with a short backswing and, and a nice controlled push through the zone. And we make sure we are making that particular shot at a very high clip before we start moving forward. Okay. Next progression could be creating some top spin without using your wrist or your forearm, kind of coming from your shoulder, using those, those big joints and that low to high swing to create the top spin. Once we kind of dominate that aspect of it, then... One second. I got a, just please. a quick question. It's just if I'm listening to this, what, yeah, at what stage do I progress? Like what's that metric? What's that? Is it that you can make 100 in a row? Like what, like... At what point is it okay to start incorporating new, new technique and new shots? Well, that, that's, that, that's a great question. And I'm not sure that there's an absolute perfect answer for that. But high clip, you are, 100 out of 100 seems strong. But making it at a very high clip where you are winning games, you are winning points, being plain, and you're making it so much that you can have a little extra risk reward added into it. So that's, that's where that base of consistency comes from. And it's a real threshold. Some players think it's, I'm making six out of 10. I'm making more than half my shots. I'm going to move forward and go for something harder. I think that's a mistake. We want to get more up into the 90 plus percent. We're making these, the, these basic shots before we start adding to it. Okay. The and, way I think about it, Adam, is you in the midcourt. Um, you have to be upset that you missed a shot, right? Like it, it has to be like surprising to you that you missed a shot. Like I like you missed a shot in the midcourt, Adam. You're like, this is this is my best shot. How how in the world could I possibly miss this shot? Like once you have that feeling, like call it a forehand dink or a backhand dink, then I think you could start progressing. Yeah, I'm I'm flabbergasted when when, <laughs> when I miss that shot. Now, get, getting lit up from the kitchen that's standard. I, I get lit up from the kitchen all the time, but missing a third or a fifth or a seventh that's that's obscene. That that does not happen. So, uh, and I think it's just so easy to watch pro pickleball and you see, you know, Tyson McGuffin with this loop, Anna Bright with this beautiful loop on yep. their dinks and their drops, and a lot, that extra motion on the backswing, and you want that, and they make it look so easy. But if you don't start playing and build to that point, you just start going after it. I think it's not going to be the best situation because your results aren't going to be good. You're not going to be as happy with your play. So make use those stepping stones to get where you need to be with your shot progression. And just don't start flipping with the wrist and going for those crazy shots that you see from the pro players. You have to establish that base. It's super important. And I think... Especially for the amateurs watching now, right? Like so many, so many players have moved to roll dinks where they're hitting topspin dinks, especially on the forehand. But you're also seeing it a lot more on the backhand. You see it; it's super prevalent in the women's game, right? You see, you see more roll dinks off the backhand than you see uh, one-handed, one-handed more slice dinks. So, um, just have to understand that it's. Uh, that takes a ton of reps and not only that but like you know you see anna you see anna bright with kind of the roll dink in the loop that's not just from pickleball that's from you know playing tennis from you know being able to barely walk and having so many reps you know in that motion that's not so it's not like oh anna bright's been playing for two years she developed it really quick like it, that's a that's a stroke that she's been hitting for a very long time in tennis and this is just a modified shorter version of it but it takes a lot of time yeah i agree completely she's got well over ten thousand hours in that kind of muscle memory, those repetitions from tennis. So she kind of started at a much higher point than, than a lot of the amateurs out there. And it, it can even be counterattacks as well. You know, we see a lot of players go into the scorpion or or really taking big cuts on counterattacks. Your timing has to be perfect. Start straight, direct to the ball. You're on it. Your timing is great. 
then you can start adding, but you can't start adding until you get to that point. Progression. I think in one, one piece you mentioned is short backswing. And I think that's super important because if you think about like just, you know, biomechanics of a stroke, no matter what it is, the shorter it is and the less moving parts there are, the less that can go wrong and break down, which is why when I'm teaching beginners how to dink um, and volley, it's you're keeping your wrist locked, you're keeping your elbow locked. Those, those two hinges aren't moving. You're moving from the shoulder and really nothing else because if you're doing that, not much can break down. Uh, did, did you just do that whole segment to set me up to say kinetic chain? I'm just waiting on it, man. <laughs> uh, I guess. And I'm talking about hinges. I'm talking about the wrist leading to the shoulder. And I, wh- I don't know what that's called, but I know somebody that does. Down the kinetic chain. Start with the shoulder. <laughs> big. Then we can go forearm and we can go wrist and we can get all that other fun stuff involved, but not until we start with the shoulder and make it simple. No hinges, Robert. Don't use them until you're very comfortable with what you're doing. I like that. Love it. Adam Stone's tip of the week. There it is. There it is. And we're going to, I think we're going to alternate. So uh, I think that next, next week will be your tip of the week. And of course I will add to that, but I like this little back and forth. Uh, There's about 946 uh, segments we can have on this to improve uh, uh, amateur play. And we all know that we, have some guy in our group, Larry the Lobber, Steve the whatever, that we want to beat. So practice these things that we're talking about. We've been through the ringer and, and, and these things. We, we've taught a lot of pickleball. Uh, everyone loves winning. Winning is fun. And uh, when you train and you try to improve the right way, it just expedites that process. Uh, yeah, just, I, I, dude, for whatever reason, I'm getting more into like the tips and the educational aspect of it. But I think... Um, maybe a hot take. I think most of pickleball comes down to being in the right spot for the right shot. I think court positioning and being in the wrong position on court is, is, yeah, I think that's the biggest deal there is. I think, yeah, I think if you're in the right spot on court, a lot of stuff solves itself. Like it does. Like call it call it after the after the return. Like I'm uh, my girlfriend's in a women's league on Thursday, and it's like a team of four, and they do kind of MLP style. And the the glaring thing that I see from like three five four zero oh, four five is, and we see it in pro too, right? When you're trying to switch, but they're playing MLP style, so there's no switching. You're just staying on one side, but you're they're still not getting to the kitchen line, so they're hitting these fours from four feet behind the kitchen line popping up and then it's just crash, you know, crush. So just purely by getting to the kitchen line and hitting a, hitting your fourth from the kitchen line, you're hitting a volley from your waist versus hitting it from your shoestrings. So court positioning, I think is underrated. And I think if people just looked at where they are, were on court for most of their shots, it would solve a lot. Yeah. So, so much, even at the kitchen line, you have this beautiful locked wrist and elbow when you're at the right position at the kitchen line You squeeze the middle a little too much and you have to take a couple steps out wide that's when the wrist gets involved so yeah so keep that 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 contact point where you are on the court and how you're using your lower body to kind of set up your stroke is just the absolute first thing that you need to do because everything follows from that point god i I, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep just building on this segment because there's more i need to say based on what you just said and that is like you said when you get pulled out wide from the kitchen line let's say you're pinching middle and then somebody hits a pretty wide dink and then you're trying to you're trying to track it down and the natural thing is to reach out and get wristy with it right to try to scoop it back um but the one thing that is super helpful when i teach this is you know the ball is going out wide and before you even move, you know the angle that your paddle needs to be at to get that ball over the to get that ball over the net. So set the paddle first, you know. So if you're moving to your right or to your left, like if I'm moving to my left, hitting a backhand dink, and those that, those of you that can't see this on YouTube, I'll try to talk through it uh, so you can hear it on the audio side of this. But it's cocking that wrist there and just moving from there because you know if your wrist if your wrist and the paddle faces at that angle before you even start moving that all you have to do is get to the ball and the ball is going to go in the right spot versus trying to just 
scramble, run, and then put the paddle out. So set the set the angle of the face before you even start moving. I mean, th- we we just did I don't know thirteen weeks worth of tips in one segment right there. That's <laughs> that's, that's, that's that's lovely. <laughs> it's, it's lovely. And I, I, Adam, I tell you right now, people are going to love this because this is it, it's honestly the most requested stuff from the podcast is more is more tips on how to get better because you know what people people are fine with the program but at the end of the day people want to go out and and get better today yeah i mean there's big time pro junkies that love watching pro pickleball and that number is building 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 but the number of of players at the local park trying to improve their game is it's not in comparison right now with total numbers so maybe we get there at one point but it's it's not right now so i I agree or or maybe maybe we don't Uh, maybe or maybe we don't yeah if yeah, maybe we don't. <laughs> Which is also okay because pickleball is a dope sport and it's getting, you know, there's a study that just came out that I, I'm confused because I know the APP put out a study that said 48 million people played pickleball this past year or whatever it was. And then I, I guess the industry report came out that people go off of year over year and it said 13 million, which is still a gigantic jump. I think it was, you know, eight or nine million the year before. So it's a 50% jump. And it's 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 on it's in line with I think uh, baseball and something else, but it had tennis at twenty three million, which I dude I don't I just don't know if I can believe it. I don't know if there's twenty three million tennis players in America and thirteen million pickleball. I just I have a hard time believing there's twice as many, almost twice as many tennis players as pickleball based on what's happening out there. So yeah, either way, the pickleball the pickleball is a sports here to stay. It's not a fad. It's too accessible. It's too easy to get started. It's getting people moving and healthy. And it's already bigger than tennis, to be honest, in terms of participation. Well, I, I just, whatever Elon Musk says, he's, <laughs> he, he, says he says pickleball is way more convenient and way better than tennis. So I'm, I'm going with that guy. If he says something, I, I believe him. It's true. It's true. So, wow, wow. That was a, that was a gigantic tip of the week. Yeah, I like that. Uh, also, uh, this past weekend, we had a little uh, Carvana PPA tour in Mesa, Arizona, and I was lucky enough to uh, be one of the lead commentators there. I'm going to be doing quite a few PPAs moving forward. Uh, I hope I'll be doing some MLPs as well, but we'll just have to see uh, on that merger front. But we had some very interesting matches and, and some pretty quality play out there, uh, back-to-back tournaments and uh, Arizona, uh, just a ridiculous pickleball community out there. Tons of, tons of courts, tons of play, lots of amateurs, and the crowds were pretty ridiculous, to be honest with you, as we had a morning session, an afternoon session. They were even lined up to get in, which is something I hadn't quite seen before. So uh, let's do a little rundown of some of the results, and uh, let's just go ahead and start with with men's singles as we had <laughs> 77 players in the qualifier and 48 players in the main draw. I believe that's 125 total. It was pretty wild. Clearly the most variance in any of the events that we have in men's singles. And <laughs> when you got some, uh, not maybe not random player, but some new player named Kaysen Campbell, 17 years old, just running through high-end singles player it's just kind of a microcosm of where we're at in the sport and uh especially in men's singles yeah that's a that's a silly number of entrants um but not 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 terribly surprising considering considering that it's the easy easiest crossover for tennis players uh to come in you don't need a partner you can sign up you can you know there's enough courts everywhere now where people are practicing and watching and you know, honestly, I think it helps that that you have tennis players seeing Jack Sock come over and play, Sam Query come over and play, Donald Jung come over and play. And I think there's a little effect there where um, that, that's going to continue legitimizing the sport and the fact that you can come in and, and make a name for yourself and make some money playing this relatively new pro sport that has a lot of similarities to, to tennis singles anyways. Obviously, a lot of nuances and doubles that – that is the challenge for a lot of the tennis converts to figure out and it just takes more time and more reps on court but uh singles 
especially with paddles nowadays, you can you can get the top spin. You can the strokes not so different than tennis in terms of uh, rolling shots, rolling balls now with top spin, angles cross court, which you could never do, you know, a few years ago. So I think yeah, I think and I think it's awesome. I think I think we talked about this, Adam. I was, you know, I was even to the point with singles where I'm like, let's just, why are we even doing this? It's, it's not even really pickleball. Let's get rid of this. And now it's, I have a blast watching. I think it's super fun. I think, um, I don't necessarily think the, the paddle technology's hurt it. I think it's helped it in respect to singles. Um, I like, yeah, it's just, it's, it's making athleticism more, important essentially right it's making um court coverage like you're seeing with jack sock i mean the dude's getting to the semis and you know he's he's losing did he he lost to stackshrude uh yes he did yeah and stackshrude stackshrude's like the i think he i think it was closer this time though um and stackshrude's uh similar to ben in terms of playing style where has good passes but also also incredibly uh, skilled, skilled in cat and mouse, and can you know can close quickly, and has really good angles. Can can manipulate the paddle to, to take a forehand from the kitchen line and go cross court, go line. Same with the backhand. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think once call it a jack can really dial in cat and mouse. I think he's. I think he's the number one player in the world. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to disagree. And yeah, I remember back in the day, some guy would just do one slide out wide, and we're like, "Oh man, what an athlete!" You know. And now, now guys, every single shot back and forth, laterally uh, hitting incredible shots on the full run while sliding. It's just kind of standard at this point. And, and you know, as I mentioned, just uh, with Case and Campbell. Let's just look at this body of work. I mean, he escaped round one. This is a guy who made an awesome run. We're talking about him. And he won 12-10 in the third in round one against Marshall Brown. He beat Colin Schick and Dylan Frazier. And he was up 5-1 in game three against Jack Sock in the quarterfinals. Just wild that a relatively unknown can jump in there and do that. And he is... But uh, he beat the snot out of Schick too, I think, right? Uh, yeah, and let's. I have, I have the score line here. So actually, he did not. It was twelve ten in the third against Schick. Schick too. 11. So, yes. So Brown to twelve ten in the third. Schick twelve ten in the third. <laughs> and then uh, Dylan Frazier eleven six in the third, and then eleven five. He lost in the third to Jack Sock after being up five one. So he actually lost ten points in a row at the end of that quarterfinal. So wild score lines and wild play uh, throughout. And but shows, I, I ha- just shows the. Mm, the margins are so small, right? You lose twelve ten to Marshall Brown, and you know we're not talking about you. You're not, you're not, you're not. You, you know, you're on to the next tournament to try to prove yourself. But that I think that's also the draw, Adam, of of having that many players in a singles draw is you need one good run to put yourself on the map, and then you know a lot a lot of doors open, whether it be sponsorships, whether it be direct entry into these tournaments where you're not having to play twelve matches before you play somebody in their first match. So it's yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, and and a shout out here too, as Casey Campbell has been working with Romanian Tower Two Eden Lika in South Florida. Of course, Romanian Tower 1 is your partner, Andre Deescu. So uh, all kind of working together, a small community here in the racket paddle sports. So uh, very cool stuff. And I have to mention this because it's just unreal to me. Jack Sock plays with the Lux, which is phenomenal paddle. Touch, feel, 20 millimeters thick. And the pace that he's hitting the ball with with this paddle is ridiculous. And you play with the Lux. So do you think it's ridiculous as well? Yeah, dude. I've thought a lot about this. Uh, it's, it's, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, make, it's made me question a lot of things about myself. <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> truly. Um, and, like, like, my thought process is, like, well... What's he like? What's his weight at? Like, what? Like, is he is his tape at the top? What? Like, we're how are we using the same paddle, and how is he generating that, and I'm generating this? <laughs> 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 so I, I I am curious. Like, Jack, if you're listening, what 
like, I'd be curious. What are you weighting that paddle at? Where's the lead tape? And uh, uh, do you want to arm wrestle? Because yeah, what? <laughs> because I think you would win. I mean, yeah. no, his 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 arm's so lively. It's and Adam, we talked about progression in terms of shots for the tip. Uh, obviously, Jack Sock has a lot of reps in terms of tennis at the highest level. Um, known for a gigantic forehand in tennis, super whippy, super wristy, and he is showing that that translates pretty pretty well into pickleball because it's it's really the same stroke and right on contact, dude. The acceleration he has through that thing is is bonkers, and a lot of them are dipping in wildly enough, right? And and the Lux isn't Lux isn't this new trend of the raw carbon fiber. It's a different surface material. It's still carbon fiber, but the fact that he's getting that much dip on it as well just shows that I am using the paddle very, very wrong. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is it is wild. And he even does the little cobra thing where he kind of waves it up in the air before he whips through. And this is the perfect situation of do not try this at home if you are an amateur player. He has... <laughs> so many hours ahead of you on the mechanics and the repeating of them so uh definitely a special thing i said it on the broadcast i'm watching a unicorn skill set in jack sock we have riley newman and thomas wilson incredible athletes out there and i just had to bring up uh my incredibly vanilla skill set compared to these guys just like you uh using the same paddle as jack and not quite hitting the ball the same way uh Let's, I'm going to mention two more things about men's singles before we move forward. Federico Staxrude, three tournaments, three championship Sundays, one title, incredible consistency in a very deep field. And also, Connor Garnett in the bronze medal match against Jack Sock was able to defeat Jack 11-2, 11-3. So quite the score line there for Connor Garnett to snag that bronze. Uh, let's move on to ladies. Uh, so we had eight ladies in the qualifier, uh, so not near as much as the fellows, but that is building uh, for the women's singles draw and some pretty interesting scores as well. We've had, we have Leah Jansen back in the mix for all of 2024, and actually Anna Bright squeezed in the draw. She has not been playing much singles, but with the progression format, she likes to have a match before she starts her doubles to get warm and kind of go into the rest of the day. So I thought that was very interesting uh, for her. It's, a, and, it's such a good point. I've thought about that a lot. Like the, the times I have played singles, it hasn't been in a progression draw, but it's been, you know, obviously a Thursday, then a Friday. And dude, it's, it's nice to get out there get on court, get the feel of the ball. All, you know, especially at the outdoor tournaments, all the conditions are very different. Arizona is very dry. Uh, the ball flies a lot quicker than a lot of other places. So that's, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's awesome. And the fact that she was doing it as kind of a warm up and still having an incredible result pushing Leia, pushing Leia to a third game is, uh, just shows that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ladies traditional doubles players that are incredibly talented at singles, but I do very much understand why they don't all play singles all the time. Yeah, right. And uh, just a couple inter interesting score lines throughout. Uh, Anna Bright, she took down Judith Castillo, who's been playing incredible. Uh, yeah. Le Leia Jansen taking down Paris Todd comfortably. And then Leia played Anna. I did not see the match, but 1-11, uh, 11-7, 11-7. I heard games two and three were very high quality. And then yeah. we had uh, Salome Davidze defeating Catherine Parento. And I know Salome has that five seed uh, she's got some solid points on the PPA tour, but uh, to beat Catherine Parento, who is just moving so well, so fit out there in her singles game with all the variety, it is a great result. And yep. uh, Mary Brasha, terribly consistent to start 2024. And we have to mention all these great players, these great names, and Anna Lee Waters just keeps doing her thing. Two and three versus Brooke Buckner, who's been playing great. Five and three versus Leia, and eleven zero, eleven eight in the gold medal match against Mary Brasha. She's just on another level right now. Yeah, and I know people are tired of talking about it, but uh, it's insane. It's, it's insane. insane. It's, it's insane. insane. It's insane. 
And that's actually the it's the reason I like actually tuning into women's singles. And people are like, oh, it's the same result every time, but um, not really. There's there's some differences. It's um, like comparing watching her play a singles final, or even even her and Catherine playing a doubles final, versus call it call it Ben playing a singles final or the John's Eye playing a doubles final is that is that Annalise still gives you like there's still even if she like if it's a tight game she's still like really dialed in and focused and thinks she she thinks uh, obviously she she thinks she's going to win and should win but there's like a come on focus Annalise like there's stuff like that where it shows that like it's not boring to her where it, in the other sense it's boring to them a lot of the time right and i like the fact that she's she's it's hard to do, dude. It's hard to do when you win that much to still have that much hunger and fire and like want to win so badly because everybody's gunning for you every single week. And for her to still just be relentless and not wanting to give up any points and wanting to beat these other women very badly, I think that's understated. And I think her will to win is is fun to watch for me. And I, I'm excited to watch – you know the other ladies come up and challenge her because that's I think that's what's really gonna. I mean, obviously Annalise's great, but I think that's what's really gonna show how great she is when other women get a little closer and show how good of a competitor she is. Man, she she's so mentally tough and yeah, at such a young age. And I always talk about how big of a disaster I was as a teenager. Just you know, just typical teenager she is not yeah. a typical teenager uh she really does have a strong mental game and it's it's incredible to watch and just a little go back to to men singles ben john's not able to to make it to championship sunday in either of the first two tournaments he did capture gold in this last tournament back on track uh yeah but annalee waters it's wild so uh what's it just on this note adam because i please I'm, i try to think about it and i'm What's it gonna take? What's it gonna take to beat her and and singles, specifically singles? It's it's going to take a physical presence. It's like literally her only weakness is her height and her reach. Her defensive ability and her court coverage ridiculous. Her shot making absolutely obscene. So it's just gonna take, I think, one of these. Ladies who's six foot, six one. A Jack Talk equivalent in women's, basically. Exactly. So that to use the leverage to whip through the ball and get the power and the ability to neutralize her rolls. That that's really one of her best things is is the passing shots and the ability to roll the ball with topspin on both sides, forehand and backhand. And Leia, great at the kitchen line, great with the first volley. So maybe it just takes a Leia with a little extra to to kinda neutralize what she does but right now it's just it's just hard to see someone uh, much less beating her but beating her consistently one thing that i noticed um this was it, it not a direct translation but in the women's doubles match it was mari humberg um and georgia johnson playing anna lee and Catherine. and mari is unique in the respect that i mean she does it too often in my opinion like on thirds her forehand her forehand third is like a big forehand chop, uh, which is going to leave the ball high a lot. But, dude, I don't think men's or women's, anybody hits a knife return, knife, like a nice knife slice return better than Mari Humberg. And I think, I think the ball being that low for Anna Lee in singles would cause a lot of issues. I think the women that are just hitting top spin – flat returns to Anna Lee, the ball sitting up nice and high, especially on the Tui and the forehand, where it gives her it's like right in her strike zone. I would love to see somebody I don't you know, Mari doesn't play much singles, but I would love to see somebody try to use that tactic in terms of knifing low returns deep to Anna Lee. Take some risks, you're gonna miss some, but make it really hard for her to get underneath that ball to hit that top spin where she can really, really dip it. Because Mari knifes the return, and I'd like to see. Yeah. I know, I know that's 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 a, probably an uncommon take, an unpopular opinion, especially because it's given you the same spin. 
But if you're able to keep it as low as Mari can keep it, it's really, really tough to hit good passing shots that low. And also, she doesn't have that extensive tennis background because she's so young she's been playing yeah. pickleball and i think the tennis players I, I i love hitting topspin off of slice so maybe just that fact plus the keeping it low could be something and we're, we're digging right now because the, <laughs> I mean, yeah we, we, i'm throwing we, spaghetti at the wall right now seriously i mean yeah, yeah i mean you have to though you literally yeah. have to with the way that she's playing so just unreal and we'll get to mari humberg a little later yeah. in this recap and i like a lot of what she did out there uh moving on to mixed 51 teams in the qualifier in mixed doubles, and unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties with internet at the venue between the Vivian David Thomas Wilson and Jackie Kawamoto Riley Newman match that went 15 13 in the third. It was one of the most insane matches I've ever seen. At the end, we had it, it, it was like one unbelievable point with gets, resets, and offense and firefights, and then it would be a super tight point. So you, you had like the tightness and the pressure of how bad the athletes won it, and then you would have just an amazing point showcasing their talents. I think it had a little bit of everything, and it was a tough break that some, if not all, of the viewers weren't able to see it. Uh, but the level, the level, and not just that match, a lot of these matches is it, it, just wild, just yeah. wild. Yeah, there's just not it's, it's it's clean stuff. There's not a lot of errors at all. Not many free points, like unless you said where it's really high pressure moments and you get a little tight on a third, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, you just there's a lot less random errors these days, right? Like there's everybody's making a lot of balls, especially with some of the high octane play early in the point with drive and crash. Now, you, you're you definitely going to miss a few more returns and serves when you're going bid, but once the point kind of gets going, it's it's very clean and very good stuff. Yeah. Uh, one of the best matches also, I mentioned the uh, the previous match, but the, the Sox CP, Catherine Prento, and, and Ben Annalee match was, was pretty wild too. Uh, yeah. Just Sock had a couple combinations and a couple pressure points that I just don't see other people doing and yeah. he showed he showed a bit of restraint with some dinking at the kitchen line now not I wouldn't say a lot <laughs> not a lot I wouldn't say a, I wouldn't say <laughs> a, a lot of restraint uh, restraint but you know you're playing you're playing Ben and Anna Lee you, you can't just full send craziness and you can go 80 percent but you just can't go 100 and I like what I saw from him just kind of pulling back a little bit and, and being fairly consistent with his dinks uh, I, I would say that's going to get cleaned up more and more. You mentioned his cat and mouse play in singles. Like once his soft game is already very good, but once it gets to that elite level, uh, that's that's a watch out situation. Yeah, and I think to me that was my favorite match of the tournament. To be honest, uh, just um, it's it's this factor of I'll be honest. Usually watching mixed for me is pretty boring. Um, what I like about watching Jack and Mixed is similar to why I like watching or like why growing up I like to, you know, I tune into WGN and watch watch Michael Jordan play a random team on a Tuesday night because you just never know what he's going to do that night. Same with Caitlin Clark uh, on the women's side right now with Iowa. Um, by the way, minimum ticket price for her game this Sunday against Ohio State. Ohio State's ranked two, Iowa's ranked, I think, five, is $500 minimum ticket price to get in the game, secondary market. And I think average ticket price is close to 600 bucks. And, it, that, I mean, just wild stuff. So, I mean, you're talking about, like, generational athletes, and, you know, pickleball is obviously a new sport. But the fact that, you know, people – but I guess point being, people tune into that stuff because you never know what they're going to do in any given game. And I, I feel the same way about watching Jack – is he's doing stuff on the pickleball court that, you know, one would probably be, you know, you teach not to do it, but he's proving that you can do it, which I find to be very, very fun. Um, he's very lighthearted on court. He has, it, it comes across as he's having a, f this is Selker. He's having a blast. <laughs> God, sorry, Selker TV. That was great. That was but he's having, <laughs> 
he's having a blast on court and he uh yeah it it's it's just a joy to watch and he's his combos dude from the left where he's he's flicking forehands and ready for that next ball and his raw power putaways with the lux is is bonkers stuff so yeah so fun to watch dude and you know i knew he was going to be fun to watch but i think i'm i'm even a little surprised about how much i'm enjoying it so i yeah big props yeah pickleball is not solved people and when you have a unicorn skill set like jack sock you might as well try to figure out some different things and and, and you don't know what he's going to do so last last note on mixed doubles uh tough break uh for two teams as james ignatowicz had a bit of a shoulder injury and he was able to play but uh was definitely not himself. So he, he was grabbing at that shoulder after a couple overheads, and unfortunately, he continued to play, and he kind of winced on some two-handed backhands and even a soft shot where he had to reach. So we hope that he is going to have a speedy recovery and not have to miss any tournaments, and if he does, only only a couple. But that was a tough break. And also, Tyson McGuffin had to pull out uh, uh, due to illness, and he was having a nice run with Megan Dazon. So hopefully yeah. both of those players uh, are, are not going to miss much time, if any. Uh, but, yeah, we, I, we hate I, injuries. We talked about your knee earlier, yeah. and it, it's it's just the worst. You just hate to see it. I've, yeah, and I've felt the, the James injury, the shoulder, or the same thing where you think it's really – and you saw him wincing clearly on any kind of overhead where he's coming with the shoulders up, but – I think the, the one people don't realize is like when I had this shoulder injury, it was a labrum issue. When you come across to hit a backhand counter even, it still pinches right there. And, I mean, you're talking about one of his better shots is that backhand counter and even coming across for a dink. So, uh, yeah, I haven't talked to him. I don't know if you have, Adam, but hopefully it's, hopefully it's uh, something that can be solved pretty easily. Yeah, uh, it, it really is too bad. Um... Moving on to women's doubles, 46 teams in the draw. Love that. Love that a lot. Huge. And uh, Bobby Oshiro, Millie Rain making a nice little run. Uh, they were able to beat Elise Jones and Megan Fudge, 11-6 in the third, and then beat yeah. Lauren Stratman and Leah Jansen, 5-5. Five and five. Uh, yeah. Maybe I mean, that's clearly an upset, but maybe not a massive one. But then you throw in that score line of 5-5, five and five, pretty, pretty good stuff from them. And then also... Uh, having a 12-10 game with the undefeated Catherine Prento and Annalie Waters uh, uh, along the way, you know we don't we don't talk about that team too much uh, on the PPA tour. So good for them. Yeah, and I don't. To me, not a surprise. I mean, Bobby's always a rock and going to make a ton of balls. Um, I think Millie's the X factor, and if Millie's on, dude, she's she's on. Um, I think in the past, what we've seen with Millie is she can she can make a little too many unforced errors but if she cuts down on that dude they are a force to be reckoned with obviously uh and then and then we mentioned mari humberg earlier i mean spins and we're not just talking about the cut slice the top spin that she was creating from the one-handed backhand and also hitting it at an angle i was very very impressed and if there was some random errors sprinkled in but she was giving Annalie and Catherine some trouble. I mean, yep. c- clean winners on the angle, and if that heavy cut doesn't sail too long where you can take it out of the air, if it hits the court, it, it was kind of eating them up a little bit. So very impressed with her game, and if she can, you know, like I said, clean up a couple of, of the random soft errors, I liked the skill set quite a bit. Yeah, Mari's... Mari has taken me by surprise many a times on the court with her backhand, um, with her backhand flick. It's, you know, I know a lot of people talk about how Edda Wright has a nice one-handed roll out of the air. Uh, tell you right now, Mari Mari Humberg has the best one-handed flick in the women's game. Period. End of story. Um, and once she can clean up, like I said, like, doesn't like the right side much, likes the left side a lot because her backhand slice dink is money. Her uh, flick out of the air is money on the roll. Uh, doesn't like that forehand drop very much. Chops at it a little bit, slices, too, too slice heavy on that. If she can kind of flatten that out or even develop like kind of a roll from the back, from the back of the court for those drops um, and clean up some of the midcourt stuff, dude, she's, she's I mean – She's got some of the. She's got like, she's got the best weapon in the women's game, and I, I 
yeah, I don't say that lightly um, out of the air. So if she can clean up the other aspects, I mean, she's she's a top top player. Yeah, and, and I th- I would even call what Etta Wright does and some of the other top ladies on the one-handed backhand side, it's almost like a hybrid of a poke and a roll. I know that's not super scientific there, but it's not that full roll where they really completely dip the paddle head and then whip through. Mari Humberg's is legit. It is, I mean, it is down and it is through the zone very nicely. So uh, great job for her, and I'll just run through who they beat real fast before we move on. Mm-hmm. Beat Lucy and Callie, beat Schneeman and Tarashenko, and then beat Anna Bright and Vivian David in the bronze medal match for Mari Humberg and Georgia Johnson. What a run. Megan Dazan and Edda Wright look good again. They are really playing well, and I know that <coughs> they, they lost in three games in the uh, gold medal match, but games two and games three were both 12-10. They have a lot of length, they have a lot of power, and I think if anyone can disrupt this undefeated team it's going to be a team like that who can put the pressure on and most importantly for me given the world-class defense of cp and alw put the ball away when they get a chance yeah i think you're exactly right i think uh, this might be wrong i i saw somewhere that the only match the only team that dizon and etta have lost to is Catherine and Anna Lee. Is that correct? As a partnership? Uh, I mean, I should probably know this, but I do not know for sure. But I. But that, that that if that's the case, that would be that's pretty wild that they've that they haven't lost to anybody else. So I think you're exactly right, and I think you're right in terms of the recipe of beating them. You have to have raw putaway power. Um, I think I think in terms of consistency, the Kawamotos are, you know right there but i think just lacking a little bit of the offense and the put away power is what hurts them in respect to beating that team particularly obviously they can beat anybody else any given day um but i think you're absolutely right adam and what was i think there's an interesting result i think mari and georgia got they won bronze who did they beat in bronze they they beat a b and viv david i mean huge w huge w I mean, that's an insane team that fits together seamlessly as well with Anna Bright on the left and Vivian David on the right. So that, that, that's, a, that's a really nuts win, uh, in my opinion. And, like, I mean, I'll say it again. I said it just a second ago. Um, good for them. Uh, awesome run. Yep. Uh, moving on to men's doubles, we had 54 teams in the qualifier. I believe 48 in the main draw with 16 buys so over a hundred total teams in men's doubles really nice i had the pleasure of calling a julian arnold and mint monroe jack monroe and i kind of like what i see from uh mint so he has been he, he has been playing pickleball for over 10 years he stopped play tournament play to play some high school basketball but he's ambidextrous he has pretty dang good hands, and he has great athleticism with Ernie's and crashing after the Julian Arnold drive. One of the yep. main reasons why they were able to beat Tyson McGuffin and Deckel Barr uh, couldn't uh, uh, win their last match, obviously. But I like what I see from a, a relatively new player, even though he's not new. Yeah, Junior Met and I played. We played the English Open. That's the only term we've played together. Um, but yeah, he's. He's a scary, talented player. The yeah, the only thing you know, I played him in Punta Gorda with Richard Livernese, and they. I mean, they they had. I was you know on one leg, but they. There's no reason we should have won that match. So I think experience wise, playing those big matches against the better teams, you know, the more experience he gets, the better he's going to continue to get. I think the only thing that he has to be careful of is having too many weapons and you know we see that with players that are just uber talented they they can do so many things with the ball it's it's like almost like a dj young right where you have so many options that sometimes it's overthinking and um just lack of consistency a little bit poor, poor dj that he, he just falls into that category because that's the first name i thought of too when, when you were just talking so yeah uh and dj had a pretty solid run too had a, had a nice win uh, with connor garnett but uh of course we have to talk about gabe tardio and andre Tayescu, yep. who 
man, they, they looked really, really good. I did not see Championship Sunday. They, they lost in three games. But to beat the John Zai and the fashion that they did with Gabe Tardio just firing away high and hard at the neck left shoulder area of Ben John's in front of him was impressive. And this was not close, ladies and gentlemen. 11-6, yeah. 11-5. They follow it up with an 11-2, 11-6 victory over Pat Smith and Jay DeVillier and then take down Thomas Wilson and Riley Newman in two games. What a run from these two. You have a ton of experience, obviously, with Andre, and you know Gabe Tardio's game well. Uh, what do you think about that run? Yeah, I think, I yeah, to me, not super surprising, to be honest. I think, for whatever reason, I still think Andre is kind of um, underrated in the eyes of a lot of people because he's not flashy, he's not super exciting. Dude doesn't miss much, guys. He doesn't miss much. He moves incredibly well. He covers a lot of court. His Even his attacks aren't flashy, but they are incredibly effective. He puts them in the right spot. And the dude's not very attackable. Um, you know, you think, oh, big guy, he doesn't hit the ball very hard, you know, relatively speaking, compared to a lot of players. But his gets are bonkers. You could put him in a – you can have a great speed up on him, put him in a terrible spot, and he's going to get it back in the kitchen. Um, he – has really surprising good closing speed, meaning if he's at the if he's at the baseline and you think he's staying back and you're gonna try to hit a ball deep to him, he crashes really well and closes on that ball and counters it really well. So I think, you know, Andre was being Andre and I think I think Tardio on that right side has a lot of weapons. I think a lot of the speed ups are probably going out. So if you're letting it bounce and you see him loading up, maybe let it go. But sometimes, I mean, he, he hits it right at you in good spots. It's hard to get out of the way. And um, not just that first ball, but his second his second ball, he's ready for it. And he's got really, really fast hands. So um, we saw, I, you, I know you didn't see the final, but um, not super surprising result in going down in straight games, just purely because of, J Dub and Dylan's experience playing with playing with Tardio a lot. They know they know the spots to attack them. They know the spots to get them. Um, and this is one of the deeper runs for Tardio. So I think he probably got you know the other teams weren't quite as familiar in terms of playing on the regular with him like they do in South Florida. So yeah, just super fun result. Um, and big prop, big props to the big guy and Tardio. Yeah, I agree completely. And I, I'm wondering with some of the sending and body bagging that has been a topic of conversation the last handful of tournaments if people don't start doing the Daniel Moore. And he is a very old school player. And basically, if he saw you wind up from a low position, he would just fall down. He, he, would, he would literally collapse to the ground and just yeah. let the ball go out. So I think with some of these attacks and some of the strategy that players are using – Getting out of the way of the ball is going to be absolutely huge, and if you don't have that skill, you're going to be in big trouble with some of the pace and spin these players are creating. Um, that's 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 the that's the problem. So I've run into this problem too, Adam. Where, as you mentioned, like when we first started playing, and you first saw me play, I was really good at letting balls go, like not playing out balls. I think what's shifted a little bit in terms of the landscape of the game is that. The, you you can like you can have a big wind up and with the spin that you can generate nowadays a lot of those balls are landing in so it's getting really really difficult to judge what's going long and what's just purely by trajectory right because that's like you know the split second that I have to see uh, a trajectory of a ball and the wind up is usually when I'm like not gonna touch it but now it can have that trajectory and and whip right in so it's it's getting way more challenging to to not play out balls so I will say yeah. that cat. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and I know I made that that uh, reference to Daniel Moore. And back then, we were playing with paddles, uh, smooth as little baby AJ's butt. So <laughs> now, now they now they have a little more grit and a little more spin. So I think that's a good point. And let's just touch real fast on the kids. They're not really kids anymore. J.W. Johnson and Dylan Frazier. I mean, 
11-3, 11-3 over Connor Garnett and DJ Young. 11-1, 11-7 over Matt Wright and James Ignatowicz. Granted, James had a bit of an issue. And then three smooth games in the finals. Just another day at the office for those two. Yeah, I think. And it, sh- and it shows that, you know, can't be relevant without the soft game. And I think that's the key to those guys, right? Is they don't make a lot of errors. They're going to get to the kitchen line. They're not going to give you, they're not going to pop up many dinks. And if you try to attack them because you feel like you have to because they're, these these kids aren't going to miss their dinks, they both have elite hands. So makes it makes it super challenging to beat those guys. And um, yeah, big props. I mean, consistency wins a lot of matches, and I think they they show that. Yeah, they're they're so well rounded, and and the hand speed is not lacking for those two. That's no. for sure. Um, well, Rob, that's that, that's my rundown. That's uh, that, that's all the notes I have for that recap. Uh, you got anything else that we need to touch on before we call it uh, a day on our first pod in a while? It's been lovely so far. I sure do, Adam. We're going to finish up. We talked a little bit about segments, and this is going to be trending up or down, and you get to answer. Okay? Yeah. And you get to answer, and then we can have a little mini discussion, and we will carry on from there. We talked a little bit about Caitlin Clark. We talk a lot about women's doubles. It seems like there's a consensus that women's doubles is the most fun event to watch because there's a lot of firefights. There's not a ton of dinking. Um, the, the firefights are extended. But let's go women's sports, Adam. Trending up or down? Up in a big way. In a yeah. big, big way. And... Uh, uh, we, you know, when I'm when I'm on the call, uh, I, I'm paired up with Dave Fleming, and he he likes to say, "This is why we love women's doubles," and I agree completely. Some of the, just some of the ability to firefight, get out of it, and then start a firefight again, it's just not something you see as often in men's doubles. So the exciting points, uh, just some of the lunging in the midcourt and the scrambling and the full stretch ability to put the ball back in play from these ladies is ridiculous. You talked about the ticket prices uh, uh, with Caitlin Clark and uh, some of the viewership that, that, that women's basketball is getting because of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's cool storylines. It's very, very quality athletes and it's fun to watch in my opinion. Yeah. It, it's um, yeah. I mean, and I you think about Caitlin Clark, you think about Anna Lee. It's like you want to, you just want to see what they're going to do that day. So I think, yeah, right there with you, women's sports on the on the uptick for sure. Um, let's go next topic: personalities in pickleball trending up, trending down. Uh, I would say trending up recently. But I think that there's also a bit of staleness there from some of the old guard and some of the quality teams uh, that are making deep runs. So I, I love personality. I think all viewers want a little personality on court. Jack Sock has that in spades. I mean, we have Xiaomei Martinez, Vic, just, just, I mean, who, who doesn't love that guy? But, you know, it, it's part of the deal. Everyone goes about their business differently. Uh, a lot of players like to stay locked in, focused, kind of block out uh, everything that's happening. Some players like to engage with the crowd. Tyson McGuffin, a good example. Um, so this is a tough one. I'm, I might, I'm, I'm going to say trending up just because of those couple names that I mentioned early. But I think as a whole, it could be, trend, it, it could be maybe a, a little stale and kind of, hovering right there at a point that I'd like to see it get a bit over. And yeah. uh, I guess one way to do that, we, we do have a lot of, uh, we're doing a lot of interviews uh, and we have the pickleball desk, pickleball TV desk for, for some of these events. So I would say if you're going to be one of those players that it affects your game in the moment to engage, maybe a little media training or, or some engagement in the interview after you're outside the lines would be great for viewership, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a, it's a really, really good point, Adam, because I think um, I think you and I are probably pretty similar in terms of on-court demeanor, like very locked in, focused, um, high, like high energy, but very much like high energy directed towards partner and, and locked in focused versus... Like, I, yeah, I don't notice the crowd, 
You know, I'm not one of those guys that would, that's going to be like a Xiaomi, which is like interacting, chirping, chatting with the crowd, or like a, even a Tyson, you know, trying to get the crowd into it, that kind of thing, um, which, which honestly like makes me sad about myself. I wish I was that, but um, – and I think, I think you make a good point. Like it doesn't – like if that's your style of – if that's how you play and that's how you perform your best, you know, showing personality in the post match, showing personality via social, showing pers- – but – I think it's a big piece of it, and I think, and I think that's what it's pickleball. It's pickleball. I mean, I know we like to. I know you know we make a living off of it, Adam. But at the end of the day, it's pickleball. It's not. It's you know this. There's not a ton at stake, right? It's it's pickleball. We have to have fun with it, and I, I wish I could have more smiles on court. But it's so tough, and I want to win so badly. Yeah, I, I know. And I think actually a pretty good example is James Ignatowicz because, yeah. like, I mean, I, I've, like, been four feet from him and yelled at him before in, like, an early round match that wasn't close, you know, just yeah. like, let's go, James, or something. He, he doesn't even know what's happening. Like, yeah. he is so locked into the moment, but then you, he puts the headset on for the post match interview and he says Why do you think goofy. that is, Adam? <laughs> uh, just locked in yeah just locked in so uh but but on the interviews he he, he gives a goofy response he kind of goes down some rabbit hole that no one expects whatsoever so just an example of possibly kind of changing the personality inside the lines and then outside the lines i will say with james ignatowich one of the funniest stories or one of the most one of the i mean a lot of things are odd with james fellow selkirk athlete here but this was so random. It was at MLP in Daytona, beginning of last year. Um, girlfriend and I are just watching. Like it's Challenger was the day before. We were out. Went to watch a premiere match. I think James was on the five playing with Hayden, and I'm just like I, I, street clothes. You can't really like I'm not. I don't even look like a pickleball player. Hat on. Can't really tell. And I'm just sitting at the end of the fence on the far side away from James. And he's in a men's doubles match. I believe it was uh, with Riley Newman and somebody. He was. It was that match where Riley and Kohler. Annalise. Yeah. Kohler. Yeah. Yeah. But out of nowhere, it's like three two. Um, James just like starts yelling, "Let's go, Rob! We got this, Rob!" And I'm just like, "Who's he talking to? Like he's playing with Hayden." And then like he he would keep looking at me and just like screaming, "Let's go, Rob!" Like. After like every point, and I'm just like, hmm. is he? Because you're right. He's usually very like locked, but he's just like, and it was the whole match, dude. It was, come on, Rob, you got this, Rob. Let's go, Rob. And Hayden was like, he's like, I guess you're not cheering enough because they were losing. He's like, Hayden, Hayden was just like, Rob, you got to cheer more or something. This, uh, well, I don't know what's happening. Why is he yelling your name? And I'm like, I don't know, dude. But it was hilarious because he was just, it was just locked in on me for whatever reason. Yeah, odd, odd fellow, and that's why we love him. James Ignatowicz. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe I think I have one more. Okay. And then we can, we can call it a wrap on this new, beautiful Selkirk It Feels Right podcast. And there's a couple things we do have to talk about before we let everybody disperse. Uh, okay, MLP, trending up or down? I'm going to say uh, trending up. Because I had a teeny, teeny bit of insider information that makes me feel like an end to this could be somewhat soon. And I, granted, I have, I have heard that before. <laughs> and this has pushed a lot longer than all of us uh, would hope for. So I, I think, you know, I've clearly the body of work of the last three months of trending down. But I'm going to say recently, right now in this moment, it's trending up. I just... Pray to the Lord above that we can get something done somewhat soon here. Yeah, agreed. I would say trending down, and I think the the key reason is I one I don't have the insider information, Adam. Um, but what I do know is that um, every PPA tournament that happens, every APP tournament that happens, every every day that passes without MLP being in a part of Pro Pickleball is losing brand value. I would say trending down. Hope that changes. And it wouldn't take much to change. A merger closing, MLP announcing a return, a draft, etc. would trend it up. But right now, I would say losing brand value. It's going down. Uh, last one. 
pickleball viewership trending up, trending down. Also, slash progression draw trending up, trending down. Uh, d- double up for me. I mean, we we made it on Big Daddy Fox. Uh, I was able to commentate some FS1 as well. Uh, I believe the numbers were somewhere around 500k, which was well above the 50% mark of sporting events for that day, uh, if I read that graphic correctly. So uh, absolutely trending up. And and, and I know that like some people, you know, on the YouTube and Pickleball TV, it's not earth shattering numbers, but they do pretty well on the major networks. And I think we are building to something that can be very, very good, even though it's, it's a quality debate whether uh, pro pickleball will just stay solid or really blow up in, in the next couple years. So uh, I, I like what happened with Fox this last weekend, and I think, uh, you know, given that it's only happened a time or two or never before on main Fox network, that the numbers were pretty decent. Uh, what was the other one? I forget. Uh, progression draw. Oh, w- a way up. I love it. I love it. Yeah, so yeah. it for, for, for what I do, it's a clear cut up. Uh, I get to prep. I know what matches. I know the the schedule of play, and I, I know some players still have issues with it or or don't like the change. Uh, but I think a lot of players are coming around, and I think that uh, it, you know, in six months or three months or maybe even less than that, people won't even be talking about it. It's just it's just kind of what it is, and, and a, a good format in my opinion. Gotcha. I yeah. I'll, I'll go on the other side of this and disagree. I think I think pickleball viewership. I think being on Fox doesn't really matter because it's uh, you know Fox isn't paying pickleball to be on to be on it. It's um, it's a it was a solid time slot. Obviously, um, I think you're going to get viewers. You know what do the ratings mean, right? Is it somebody that's going to watch Fox regardless? They're flipping through the channels. Um, do they watch it for one minute? Do they watch it for thirty minutes? Do they watch the whole segment? I don't know. Um, I just don't think it means that much. I think it'll mean a lot once uh, there's a media rights deal and these networks are actually paying to to have the rights to to um, to the game. I think progression draw is good. I think it should only be like majors, in my opinion. I think I like I like especially with the athleticism coming into the sport. I think fitness should matter. I think. I'd like to see, you know, I, I know every single player disagree, disagrees with this, and that's fine. But um, I think fitness matters, and I think playing all your singles matches, finishing the tournament in a day is is fun. It's good. I think watching – I get sad when I watch a good women's doubles match and then I can't watch the next round until the next day. But maybe that's just me being impatient. But I like I, – I don't hate the progression draw by any means, but I do think – there's i don't think it should be every tournament i think it should be for like the majors the big boys and i think all the others should be typical format um that's me yeah well i it, was that was that trending up and trending down or just our classic good cop bad cop as i i, I have to find a way to be meaner and uh have a trending down mixed into my trending ups so I, i'm gonna work mm. on that and i'm gonna <laughs> You know, see if hey, I can't. Hey, if, if glass is half full for you, glass is half full. That, there's not a thing wrong with that, Adam. Um, <laughs> there's lots of things that are that are trending up, and one being the Vanguard Control new Selkirk paddle be, being released. You guys have probably seen it be, you know, seen it having. It's been in Yuta Castillo's hands. A Paris Todd's been playing with it for a while. I think Lawrence Stratman's playing with Stratman. it. I. Um, I tested her out a little while back. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, um, you know, I'm pretty diehard on the Lux right now. But I, I loved it. I love it's, it's the raw carbon fiber, and not just raw. It, I mean, it feels real nice. It feels real sharp, and um, it's funny. At uh, when I was down in Punta Gorda, um, there is, uh, you know, there, there's a kid down there. That he would, he would test, he would test paddle grit by placing the paddle face on his shoulder and if it stayed it's gr- it's gritty enough if it slips off it's not gritty enough oh i like that hey yeah selkirk i mean i know i don't play anymore but i still play once or twice a month send me something i, I want to try it out just throwing that out here on the podcast maybe if i express that to the world they might i might get a shipment everyone likes getting a shipment from selkirk yeah a little unboxing action what if you unbox it adam what if you got on social media and actually showed you know, showed you opening the box and sh- sh- like, I think I'd watch that. 
Yeah, I mean that's 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 strong, but yeah. uh, I I think I could maybe do that if possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming. All right, yeah. that's all. I, that's that's all I have, Adam. This is uh, you know, this is a longer podcast for us. It, it, but I do feel like it's just because we haven't had one in a while and we covered a lot, and we are looking forward to bringing this to you every single week on Wednesday. Yeah, and and we're gonna do some preview. We have a, we have a double tournament. We have, uh, I believe, it's mm-hmm. the APP Sacramento, if mm-hmm. I knew that correctly, and the and the PPA. Uh, indoor championships and right outside of Minneapolis. So we'll have a nice preview next week and uh, touch on a few other things as well. Pretty pretty nice episode uh, after the the extended layoff. And we have producers and all kinds of you know executives and brass that are that are in the studio with us. It's been fun. Until next week, guys. This is it. Feels right. If you haven't like and subscribe, and we will see you next week.